Okay, so in previous video, you have seen that the different type of instruction that is uh, data transfer and manipulation instruction, right? then program control instruction that you have seen in the previous video. Now in this video, we will see subroutine call and return. Those uh, who have completed the lab 10, practical 10, they might be aware about this subroutine call and return. So a call subroutine instruction that consists of an operation code together with an address that specifies the beginning of the subroutine. So it's kind of your label on where you will jump, right? <clears throat> so we have a call in that. So the instruction is executed by performing two operations. Which are those two operations? The address of the next instruction available in the program counter, right? Is stored in the temporary location. And the second is how control is transferred to the beginning of the subroutine. So whenever there is a call, right? Subroutine, you can assume like your function call, right? It's the function call in your assembly level language. So your program counter that will store the next instruction that you need to execute, right? Now, suppose this encounters the call of subroutine. This program counter encounters the call of subroutine. Now, when it serves that call, right? When it serves that subroutine, at that time in PC, you have a next instruction that must be executed. Suppose if you have a call, Mm, suppose this PROC1, right? After that, you have a INCSI. This is available. So, when your CPU is executing this instruction at that time in the program counter, next instruction that is INCSI, the address of this will be stored here, right? So, what you need to do whenever you execute this at that time. What happened? The next instruction will not be this INCSI. It will be this process PROC1. That subroutine will be executed. So what happened? The address, the next instruction, because after servicing this, we need to return to this, right? So this address, we need to suppose this address is 1000. So this address we need to store in some temporary. Uh, temporary location temporary that is 1000 right once you store that the control is transferred to the beginning of the subroutine so the call now will load this address this PROC 1 right the beginning address that will be loaded here and then the next execution will be taken Right, so this thing will happen. So once you complete this again in PC, just load this address. Just load this address. What you will get? You will get this next instruction INC SI. Right. <clears throat> so the last instruction for every subroutine is commonly called return from subroutine. It transfers the return address from temporary location into the program counter as I said just before. So the different temporary location for storing the return address, right? So that address can be stored in some memory location of the subroutine, fix some location in a processor register or in a memory stack. So these are the different ways to store the temporary location or the temporary address, right? So after calling your subroutine, you need to again be at your particular position where you have, from where you call your subroutine. So that thing can be stored in this different ways. Your first memory location of the subroutine, right? And that you can store in fixed location in memory. You can specify the fixed location. In a processor register, you can specify or in a memory stack, right? But the efficient way is a memory stack. 
why i will give you the reason <clears throat> the advantage of stack is when succession of subroutine is called means one after another the sequential return address can be pushed into the stack so suppose i have called that subroutine call pro t1 right again i need to call the subroutine again i need to call this subroutine so this way again i am calling this subroutine so suppose if i specify one register if i specify only one register suppose r1 right now i am storing the return value right once this subroutine is served again i need to start the next execution right so i am storing that address here i am storing that address here now once you store this address once you store this address what happen again you need to call the subroutine again you need to call the subroutine so when you again call that subroutine call process one that subroutine this say the again the return must be stored right so that must be stored here so you can see here that the previous return previous return just wait so the previous value that is over return okay so this way you can see this is not a good thing or you require more register r2 r3 suppose this is called 30 times right so 30 registers you require right so this is not an efficient way but stack is the efficient way how this is your stack first time when you call what you will do you will store the return address here right this is the first time second time you call that subroutine again the return address you will push into this right so you are pushing that return address so whenever there is a call back right what happen this is a call once this service is over this will return to this subroutine what you need to just pop out this value and you have a return address right this is the return address now here again once you solve this again you need to go back but where this is your return address right so this is that's why this stack is efficient way right to store that return address and when succession of subroutine it give you the best result the return from subroutine return as i explained you instruction cause the stack to pop the contents of the content of the top of the stack are transferred to program counter right this popped value which has a return address now that will be stored in program counter and the program counter will execute next okay so this thing will be done when you use stack now next <coughs> the return is always to the program that last called subroutine that we understand right mm -hmm. because we have used the function in c right or factorial and all mm -hmm. and it solve the problem of recursive subroutine which i have explained you now how to implement this so we are using stack for this so whenever there is a subroutine call Never do the subroutine call. What you need to do? We are decrementing the stack pointer. Why? Because if you remember the stack organization, memory stack organization, the value upper limit that is around I think three thousand, and the lower from where we are starting that is four thousand. So from higher value to lower value we are going. Right? Your stack is expanding like this. So. if your stack pointer is somewhere so what you need to do so this is suppose first value okay your stack pointer is here because at the starting point we were not storing 
so whenever you need to push subroutine call means what you are pushing the return address you are pushing the return address right so i need to push that return address over here so first i need to increment the stack pointer so in this increment means what it's actually a decrement because from 4000 you are going to 3999 your stack is expanding like this so we are decrementing not increasing so the next stack pointer is this sp so we got that next stack pointer right this is the top of the stack now on that what i need to do i need to push the return address what is the return address the return address is the program counter value return address is program counter value because in your program counter it will store the next instruction to be executed next instruction to be executed that value previously we were storing in some temporary location so our temporary location is stack now so this value will push here in this location so that address we will push here okay once we push it what next the subroutine call that must be served so that address of that subroutine must be loaded in program counter then and then you can execute that next instruction so effective address of subroutine that must be loaded in your program counter right your sub routine that must be loaded here so then your cpu know that which next instruction they need to execute right at the end at the end right it will encounter that now this is the return so now what will happen so when you return from subroutine right when you return from subroutine what happen i need to just look at the stack take out the first address right there sp you uh, you can see the sp it is here so i need to take out this address and load this address into program counter in program counter i need to load this address and what is this address just in, you can recall this address is the next instruction that you need to execute before the call before the call this is call roc1 <coughs> next is inc si right so this is the call so in program counter this address is stored that is 1000 right so but i have make a subroutine call when this 1000 will be pushed right and the beginning address of this subroutine will be here suppose that is thousand once this is over means you are returning from subroutine right the some increment operation that took place and all and the subroutine call is finished now so when you are returning from that subroutine returning from that subroutine what happen you need to take out this value what is this value you can see this is 1000 means after your subroutine the next instruction that you need to execute to load that value into program counter this is the same program counter okay there is only one program counter in your pc so in that program counter you are loading that address of next instruction to be executed and what you will do now this is pop out so the sp will be incremented sp will be incremented So now your program counter know which instruction that program counter has to be executed. So that program counter will execute one thousand next instruction. Right now, suppose from call process one, there is another call that is call ROC two. What happened? So. call prc1 and then call prc2 so after this what it will do again it will decrement your sp and sp will be here and the 
yeah, PROC. So it will store the address of this where it has to end, right? So that address will be stored here. And then once it is stored, it will again come to the next instruction from where, suppose in let's assume this, the code is like this. All PROC2 and in there INC uh, AN. Right, I am just assuming this. So it will store the address of this INC AL here. Suppose this is 200. So 200 will be stored here. So once this subroutine is served, the return is this instruction. Right? It will call this instruction. Okay. That value will be loaded in the program counter, and then the next inst uh, instruction will be executed. Once this subroutine is over, the control will be transferred. The control will be transferred to where? To your next instruction. That is INC SI. Right? This way we will implement the subroutine call and return from subroutine. Now next is program interrupt. Right? Uh, we have seen there are some uh, interrupt like sometimes you will encounter after copying your data there is some uh, message you will get right the copy is done or there is some like if you want to skip this kind of thing right some hardware interrupts are there so there are different type of interrupts in your program so this is used to handle variety of problems that arise out of normal program sequence Right, so you are executing, you are expecting something, but there is some something or some go something goes wrong. So at that time, the interrupt will help you, and it complete that task. So it refers to the transfer of program control from current running program to another service program as interrupt service as a result of external or internal generated request. Right. It may possible the power goes off, right? Uh, update is going on and power goes off. So these are the different type of interrupt, right? Mm. So what is the difference between interrupt and subroutine? So both things are uh, doing some similar kind of thing, but there is a difference between interrupt and subroutine. So the interrupt is usually initiated by an internal or external signal. We are not initiating this interrupt, right? We are not initiating this interrupt, but it is initiated by internal or external signal, right? And then from the execution of an instruction, when you is execute some instruction, at that time it generates like. Uh, you are performing some addition and at that time it generates the overflow so that is called an interrupt we have not uh, written anything for that but it is generated right because of that hardware implementation so that is the interrupt while your subroutine we are calling that subroutine right specifically we are calling that subroutine it is not uh, implicitly called explicitly we are doing writing that subroutine call now the second is the address of the interrupt service program is determined by the hardware rather than from the address field of this right so when we have written this call call prc prc1 so this is the instruction from this instruction we get the address right Address of what? Address of subroutine, right? Which we need to solve. But when there is an interrupt, right? So in interrupt, the address is not specified in the instruction, right? Determined by the hardware of your computer. And the third one is the interrupt procedure. Interrupt procedure that is usually stores all the information necessary to define the state of the CPU, focus of the CPU rather than just storing the program. 
you have observed when we call this what we were storing in temporary we were storing the only the program counter value not anything else but whenever there is an interrupt interrupt at that time at that time what you need to store you need to store all the status of your script means status bits or register value then program counter value all this you need to solve right so once the interrupt is solved then you can again start the execution right so these are the difference between interrupt and subroutine and cpu must return to exactly the same state that it was when the interrupt occurred so this thing i have told you that that's why we are storing uh, registers status bits and all so the state of the cpu at the end of execute cycle is determined from this program counter your process register and status condition this thing you need to do this three thing the collection of all status bit right you have carry flag right then zero flag and all that is also called a status bit right in the cpu is called a program status world right this also we will store the psw is stored in separate hardware register that is a dedicated hardware uh, register for it now it includes the status bit from the last <coughs> elu operation right when status bit set when you perform elu operation at that time the status bit is set just recall the previous video right in this you have seen that four status bit right how that value set uh, for this status bit and it specify the interrupt that are allowed to occur and whether the cpu is operating in a user mode or supervisory mode right so the mode bit also that is specified in this so user mode and supervisory mode so whenever you run any program and you execute that is a user mode your the code that operating system execute right the specific code that is written for operating system that is in a, a supervisory mode right so supervisory mode uh, is uh, you can say the kernel mode right your operating system execute that right there is a not direct access to supervisory mode from a user side right so suppose if you take a example of printf statement so when you write printf and hello actually that hello that is displayed uh, is displayed on your screen so operating system is involved in that so whenever you write printf that is a inbuilt function but after that inbuilt function there is a system call right using that system call you can go to that uh, supervisory mode and from that the coordinator will be decided and the text that will be displayed on your screen right mm -hmm. so cpu does not respond to an interrupt until the end of an interrupt uh, instruction execution so during your instruction the whole instruction one instruction right if there is an interrupt until that instruction complete until that the instruction complete the interrupt will not respond right so means at the beginning of the next instruction it will check your cpu will check is there any interrupt to show if there is any interrupt to show then it will show that interrupt so just before going to the next fetch phase the control checks for any interrupt signals as i said you if any interrupt is pending control goes to hardware interrupt and that will be solved and during this cycle the content of program counter and the psw are pushed onto the stack right why it is pushed onto the stack because after service that interrupt again you can go back to your the previous state right you can pop out this value and again you can start the execution right this is services provided by your system so the branch address for the particular interrupt is then transferred to the pc and new psw is loaded into the status register to show your interrupt 
this thing you are this is one kind of call to subroutine so here what we are doing we are servicing the interrupt so from hardware the value will be loaded in program counter and new psw that will be loaded in your status now service program can be executed interrupt service program can be executed and the last instruction in the service program is a return from that interrupt instruction and when this is written what you need to do from stack you need to pop up the value that you have stored that is pc and psw right and then you can return and now thus we have taken those values so now the cpu state is restored and the original program can continue to execute right mm -hmm. now let's see the types of interrupt so there are three types of interrupt the first one is external interrupt this come from the io devices from a timing devices from a circuit monitoring the power supply from any other external source right as an example, your I/O device requesting transfer of data. So that is what it's an external interrupt. Some elapsed time of an event. As I said, the copy is complete. So at that time, it will generate the interrupt. That is called an interrupt. Then a power failure, right? So in a millisecond, they will store your status. Okay. So you can restore your data. So these are the external interrupt. The next is your internal interrupt. Internal. It arises from illegal, illegal or erroneous use of instruction, instruction or data. Right means from our program. If in your program, if some a program or something, if you have written the erroneous instruction or data, right. At that time, internal interrupt occurs. Right? For external, it, we have not written any code, right? But due to some condition, right, I/O complete or something, that interrupt will be generated. But here, for illegal use of instruction or data, this interrupt will be generated. <coughs> internal interrupt, and it is called a traps situation when it generates some error. That is. Example is register overflow. When you are performing addition and you have not taken care of length of the register, at that time uh, it may result in overflow, right? So that is called an internal interrupt. An attempt to divide by zero, an invalid operation code, or stack overflow, and protection violation, some protected value you are going to access. So these are called internal interrupts. Third one is a software interrupt. So it initiated by executing an instruction, right? So just remember in previous thing, right? The external and internal interrupt. You are not executing any instruction, but that occurs from your hardware. Means in the external interrupt, I/O complete or something, the interrupt will be generated. In the second one, internal interrupt. Right. you have written a code but then that the instruction that you have written that is wrong data that you are accessing that is wrong so that is again from your hardware but now for the software interrupt yeah you have written the instruction that this uh, interrupt must be solved right so it's a similar to your subroutine that you can see right so software inter special call instruction that behaves like an interrupt rather than a subroutine call. Right? That must be solved. Okay. And it is used by a programmer to initiate an interrupt procedure at any desired point in the program. Okay. Like a supervisory call instruction. Right? Switch from user mode to kernel mode. So you cannot write a procedure for this. Right. So at that time in your program, when you write a system call, in that system call, you need to explicitly write instruction which converts from your user mode to supervisory mode. This is a, uh, you can say software interrupt. 
okay it's not your hardware interrupt that is external or internal this is a software interrupt it is different than your subroutine because the subroutine call is where you call the subroutine and again we get the return address and all but when you call this interrupt right it will execute that task it will perform that task means from uh, user mode to supervisor mode this task is completed by this software interrupt so let's see the difference between internal and external interrupt so this internal interrupt is initiated by some exceptional condition it is caused caused by the program itself rather than by some external event as i said that you have written some uh, wrong instruction or accessing some wrong data at that time internal interrupt will generate now internal interrupt are synchronous with the program while the external interrupts are or synchronous means it may generate or it may not generate right but if you have a internal interrupt in your program means some error in your program if you read on that program again at the same location the internal interrupt will generate okay so if the program is executed the internal interrupt will occur in the same place each time because you have used the wrong instruction and that wrong instruction that will be reported by your internal interrupt at that time internal interrupt will generate right and external interrupts depend on external condition means like the copying time right it may take a 5 minutes it may take a 7 minutes right it depends now two types of architecture that is this and this right so this uh, we will cover in your next lecture okay thank you